continue our study in the wonderful book of Acts. And the theme of this study is why did God create? Why did God establish the church? What importance is the church? Does it have an importance? In fact, today in our world and our society, are we playing an important role in our world today? We play an important role in our families. We play playing an important role in our towns, in our communities. One of the things that I find is we now are in Acts chapter 5, and I'm only, once again, I'm only doing a very brief summary of this book of Acts. There's so much more in the book. Um, so I'm only taking little, little bits and pieces from each chapter to help us to see the importance. I hope to see how wonderful the book of Acts is. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at Acts chapter 5, having to do with Remelio, who was a part of the Sanhedrin. He was a, a priest of sorts. He was a part of the 70 group of very esteemed men <coughs> who, who uh, taught and who were very highly renowned and looked at. And we're going to look at his life and we're going to see some statements in which he made that on the outset, we look at it and say, well, that's a pretty good statement. However, I think what we need to do is we need to look a little beyond that and, and see and wonder, do we as a people, are we a voice of indifference? Have we become a voice of indifference? Now, there are certain places in the scripture that certainly that has happened. For example, when Jesus was having was on trial, and you had Herod and, and, and Pilate and so forth, and, and remember he would go and he went to the wash basin and he would say, I'm washing my hands of this thing. In other words, what's he saying? I don't want to be involved. You know, I, I, you're not going to put this charge on me. I'm not going to take a stand on this. I'm just going to be indifferent about it. I'm not going to to really say one way or the other, so therefore you can't blame me for this, and therefore I am going to be indifferent. And just my own personal feelings, and, and you can take it or leave it if you want to, this is not scripture, but just my own personal feelings is what's happened today in our world over the last century especially, is that we have become a people, or many of us have become a people of indifference. We don't want to take a stand. We're afraid to take a stand. How much is it going to cost me? What is it going to do to me? And therefore, as we are counting the costs, and how many of us as Christians count the costs? We, we look at things and we, and we say, well, the cost is too great. May I remind us, what would have happened if Jesus Christ decided that when the Father said to him, son, I want you to go down and pay the price for mankind. And he started counting the cost. And he'd go to the father and say, no, dad, I'm sorry. I don't want to pay that price. Where would you and I be today? Where would you and I be headed today? If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus Christ was willing, even when he counted the great cost in which it was going to cost him, said, I must do it. I must take a stand. You know, my dad had an old saying when, when I was a kid. And the old saying is this, if you, if you don't stand up for anything, you'll fall, if you don't stand up for something, you'll fall for anything. And let me ask you a question, is that, is that what is happening? We're afraid to take a stand, and because of that, because what's happened is, you know, the world has become so, so divided that we don't want to be seen in that light, and therefore we don't take a stand. We're afraid to take a stand. And in Acts chapter 5, we're finding now that the apostles are taking a stand. And because they are taking a stand, it is going to cost them greatly. For the first few chapters of Acts, we find that basically the apostles mentioned would be John and Peter. And we look at them and say, well, they, they seem to be the leaders, they seem to be the ones 
who are paying the greater price. <clears throat> However, what we're finding now in chapter 5 is that it seems like all of the apostles are now getting together and they are taking, they are taking this uh, as a group. This is a now corporate um, trial, if you will, that they, are, that they are in. And therefore, it is now the whole corporate function of the apostles, for example, and the early church is now starting to get involved in all of this. Shane, if you could give me, and, and I know I didn't give it to you, but if you could give me verse 29, I believe it is, that I find very interesting, 29 and 30, is because this is where it actually starts to take a stand. Watch what happens. If Peter and the other apostles, so this means now the other apostles, not, it didn't say just apostle. So it isn't just Peter and John. I think it's Peter and all the other apostles. Answer and said, we ought to do what? Obey God. Obey God instead of what? Man. No. What has become the philosophy of many today? I'm going to obey man rather than God. Why? Because right now, they're the ones I am facing, and they're the ones who cause the most havoc with me, and they can make life more miserable. They can, you know, whatever the case, whatever the cost is, and therefore I am I'm going to face man and I'm going to bow down to the to the dictates of mankind instead of bowing to the commands of God. Didn't Jesus answer that one day when he said to them, Why are you concerned about man who can only destroy the body? Instead of being concerned about what God has to say, because he destroyed both the body and the soul. So in other words, he deals with the whole man, not just the physical man. You see, mankind can only deal with the physical part of man, where God deals with the absolute whole of man. So therefore, the apostles go and they make the statement, we ought to obey God rather than men. What? God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and you hanged on a tree. So he's going to say, look, why are we going to follow God? Why is it that we're making the proclamation that I'm, going to, I'm not going to be a person of indifference? I'm not going to be someone who really doesn't have a strong opinion. I'm going to have an opinion on this where I am going to follow God. Why am I going to follow God? Because he hanged Jesus on the cross. Who put Jesus on the cross? Well, we did because of our sin. But who ultimately put him on the cross? God the Father. Because that is the only way in which our sins could be paid for. Our sin could be accounted for. And therefore the apostles go and said, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you, you did it, but guess what? My father did it, our father did it also, because he knew what was going to happen. Do you think all this took Jesus by surprise? When God the Father said to Jesus, you better go down and and, 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 and uh, take on humanity, take on the, the body. Last Wednesday night we, we shared a little bit about Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. What does that mean? Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, he took on physical body. He took on physical flesh. We are the only people in the world where God came down it took on physical flesh, became a human man for us. God. You see, not only was he the son of man, but he also was the son of, and is the son of God. He took on flesh so that he could bear our sins in his flesh when he died upon the cross of Calvary. Now, isn't that enough for you and I to not be indifferent about, but that you and I ought to really take a stand and say, wait a minute. If I have to choose between serving God and doing what God says, or acquiescing to what man says, which, are, which one am I going to bow to? 
while the apostles go and said, look, we ought to serve God rather than men. When going to, by the way, the word ought means it is determined that we are going to do this. Okay, he's not saying, well, you know, if I have to choose, maybe I ought to choose. No, it is determined. We have determined. We are going to serve God rather than men. So they go and they do this. Now, I want to share with us a little bit about Gamaliel and what he had to say. Now, Gamaliel is a very important man. He is probably the elite of the elite. He is the one that everyone listens to. He is the one that, that when he speaks, you know, the ear cut of his day, when he speaks, they listen. Matter of fact, Gamaliel was such a great man that even the great apostle Paul laid at his feet or knelt at his feet and listened to every word he had to say. We're told in Acts chapter 22 that Paul even goes and says, and I laid at the feet of Amelia and listened to what this man had to say. So he was thought of as being the elite of the elite. Now he's going and he's, and he's getting involved now in this conversation having to do with the early church, having to do with Peter and James, uh, Peter and John, and the rest of the apostles. They're, de they're disputing, they're, they're debating. What do we do with these cops? <laughs> I mean, here they are. They're turning the world upside down for this Jesus. What do we do with them? Matter of fact, it goes and says, if you want to give me, oh, 32, 33, in that area now, you want to give that to me. And it really is very interesting because we find that this was not just a dispute. This was something that really <clears throat> turned their heart. He goes and says, and we are witnesses of these things, and also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them to obey him. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. What does it mean they were cut to the heart? Does that mean that those, those, those the, the people in this council, the Sanhedrin, and those, those people that were, that were doing this thing, it says that they become indignant. There is a hatred that has now come upon these people. Why? Because the apostles were still teaching this Jesus. Matter of fact, I find it very interesting. If you go through this whole portion of scripture, until you get to the bottom, until you get to around verse 41, 42, that the name of Jesus isn't even mentioned. Gamaliel will not even mention the name of Jesus. The people in the Sanhedrin, in this, in this group, in this council, they hated the name of Jesus so bad that they could not even mention his name. Isn't that something? By the way, let me ask you a question. Are we seeing some of that today, even in our, in our world? Don't you dare mention Jesus. Don't you dare bring him up. Don't you dare tell people that you're religious in any way, shape, or form. Because guess what? We don't put up with that anymore. Well, it said that they were cut to the heart. And because they were cut to the heart, they took counsel to slay them. They wanted to kill them. That is how much they hated this group. Now, how long has the church been going? It's just started. It's only been a matter of maybe a few months that the church has been going now from the first chapter of Acts and chapter 2 with the Pentecost and all that, and then on through. So it's only been going a short time. But what has happened? This group of apostles, when they were preaching, there were 3,000 that were saved. Then there were 5,000 that were saved. And they were turning. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, they were turning the, the world upside down. That's the people think. They were turning the world upside down. I personally like to say it this way. They were turning the world right side up. Because they were teaching Jesus Christ. Now, in this, they wanted to slay them. They wanted to put them 
to death. Then they took up one in the council, a Pharisee named Familia. He was a doctor of the law, and they, but had a reputation among all the people and commanded to keep the apostles for a little space. He said, take these guys, put them in the next room. Give them a little space, put them in the next room. I'm going to talk just to the Sanhedrin and to the leadership here. I want to have an audience with them, and I don't want to be influenced by these apostles. So send them out. And we will make a determination as to what to do with them. Now, once again, let's just take it. This is the early church. And have we seen through the centuries, you know, it's been over 2,000 years, have we seen through the centuries that this has not let up? People have been wanting to do away with the church, wanting to do away with Jesus Christ, wanting to do away with the simple gospel of what Jesus Christ did for them. It started right here in the early church. And it says, we put them out, put them into another room, into a little space. Because I want to talk to you privately about that for a minute. So that's what he does. Verse 35, he says to them, you men of Israel, take heed to yourselves that you intend to do as touching these women. So he's going and says, look, I know what you want to do. I know you want to explain it because you have become so indignant with a hatred in your heart towards them that I know you want to kill them. But that's not the advice I want to give to you. I have some words of wisdom to you. And so often we like these little phrases, these little catchphrases that people give. And we're going to find here that Gumilio gives us a real a real wonderful catchphrase. If you just look at it on the outset, and you just look at it, you know, just kind of glancing over it, you say, now that was a good catchphrase. Now that was a good statement that community is going to make. But may I help us to understand that this statement was basically saying, guys, don't get involved. Have a heart of indifference. It's no big deal. And Gumilia is even going to, to uh, picture Jesus as a mere man. He brings up Judas, and then he brings up Theodos, and he says, remember these two guys? They had a following. People followed them, but when they were put to death and when they died, they dispersed. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. So what was Gumilia saying? He was saying, look, this Jesus of Nazareth, it's only been a few months since he's been gone. Don't worry about it. He's going to fade in the dust. He's going to fade in the woodwork. <laughs> no big deal. Guys, don't get upset about it. He's just a mere man. Is that his first mistake? Because remember, back up in 29, what did he say? Whom the Father, the God of our fathers, raised from the dead. What was the problem with the Sanhedrin? What was the problem with the Sadducees? What was the problem with these guys? They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Now you had a few Pharisees who would go in there and they would kind of put the you know, splinter into them because the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. But the 70 man council was basically predominantly made up of Sadducees. There is no resurrection. So don't worry about it. So this is what Gamaliel is doing. You know, we look at it on the outset and say, oh, isn't he giving great advice? If it's a man, it's going to fade. If it's a God, you can't win anyway. But Gamaliel didn't believe that. Now remember, I noted earlier that in Acts chapter 22, Paul goes and says, I knelt, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Can we go back for a minute and look at what was the Apostle Paul like? He was a very lovable guy, wasn't he? He was a man who was very tolerant of the church. 
Here's a man who, who wanted Jesus to be proclaimed all over the place, right? Before he became a believer. What was he doing? He was killing people. He was persecuting the church. He was setting churches afire. He was throwing people in prison. He hated Jesus Christ. Why? He was seated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel did not believe in Jesus Christ. And all he's saying to the people, to the, to the apostles, or to, I mean, to the Sanhedrin, is don't worry about it. Jesus is just a mere man. He's nothing big. In a few weeks, he will be dispersed, and everything will be okay. Well, I kind of took a little note as I was thinking about this. First of all, Amelia had a very faulty comparison. Didn't he? Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ just a mere man? Is he just a mere human being who, who really is no, nothing, nothing you know, big about him, nothing special about him? He's just, a, just like you and me, right? Well, yeah, he is as far as the physical part, but guess what? He is something else. <coughs> he is God. <coughs> you may have forgot that Mankind was born, born of father and mother. Jesus Christ was born of the virgin. Jesus Christ did not have the sin nature in him. So Jesus Christ was not just a mere man. He was God above. He was God. So Gamaliel had a very faulty picture of who Jesus Christ is. Oh, when he dies, everything's going to fade away. Well, let me ask you a question, and most of you can answer this question. How long has the church been going? <laughs> Over 2,000 plus years. How long has Jesus Christ been gone? About that long. And guess what? Where's the church going? It's not going to die. Matter of fact, I personally believe that until the rapture happens, the church is going to flourish more and more and more and more. Though we may not be seeing it here right now, we do have evidence all over the world that the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is flourishing. It's not going to die. You and I, and Phil says this all the time, I read the back of the book, I know we win. Right? Are you on the winning side this morning? Are you on the side of Jesus Christ who say, wait a minute, he's not going to die off. He's been going now for over 2,000 years. Guess what? He is here to stay. I am going to determine that I'm going to follow God rather than man. Why? Because the proof is in the pudding. Jesus Christ is alive today just as he was alive when he was walking on this earth and just as he was alive when they resurrected him from the dead. Jesus Christ is alive today. Do you believe that? Amen. Good. So can we say that we're not going to be a people of indifference, but we're going to be, as the Apostle said in Acts 5.29, we will follow God rather than man. But unfortunately what's happened is we have allowed the world to influence us so much that now we are following man rather than God. If Gamilio is, is saying to these guys, he said, look, don't worry about it. Let me give you a couple of, of examples. And he does, he, he gives Theodos in verse 36. And he says, hey, Theodos, he boasted himself to be somebody of whom uh, a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain and all, as many have obeyed him, were <coughs> scattered, and brought to nothing. They dispersed, and that was the end of him. You have Judas, another one, and this is not a scare yet. Judas of Galilee, in the days of taxing, and drew away much people after him, and he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, and they were what? <coughs> now Jesus has been gone for 2,000 years as far as not being here on the earth physically, but where is he? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's living inside each and every one of us that have claimed Christ as our Savior. 
Is he alive? Is he real? Is he one in which you and I need to bow our hearts to and say, Lord, I'm going to follow you and not man. I'm not going to be a person of indifference. I don't want to be involved. Isn't that what's happened to us? Oh, I don't want to be involved. Don't get me involved in that. <clears throat> when in fact, may I suggest that maybe we are facing it. A lot of the dilemmas in which we are facing today in our world and in our country because the church has stopped being involved. Because we have taken the attitude of indifference. We have taken the attitude of I'm going to follow men and not follow God. Yet the apostles determined we're going to follow God. Now, what's really, really interesting is they had a cost that they were going to have to pay. Is that what's scaring most of us? I don't want to pay the cost. I don't want to pay the price to which has to be priced that has to be paid. Let me go back to just a moment about Camellio's faulty comparison. He forgot to recognize that Jesus Christ is superior to all mankind. They forgot to recognize Jesus Christ's character. He forgot to recognize Jesus Christ's communication, Jesus Christ in saying who he is. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the Son of God. I am. Saying, hear my God name. Remember, the Jews knew that. When he mentioned the word I am, they recognized what he was saying. He is God. Now, Judas is trying to say that. Theodos may have tried to say that, but guess what? They proved very readily that they weren't. However, Jesus, he is. He still is 2,000 years later, isn't he? <coughs> he is in your life, he is in my life. How about this compassion? Now, I don't know much about this Theodos, and I don't know much about this Judas, but I suspect that when they went up into the mountain of overlooking Jerusalem, they probably didn't weep over the lost. But what did Jesus do? He wept for the city of Jerusalem. He wept for the people. He wept because he knew that when they died, they were going to die and go to hell. Unless they trusted him as their personal savior in their, in their life. And he, and he did the very same for you and me. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior right now today, he's weeping for you. He's weeping for you. Because he says, I died for you. Just accept the fact that I died for you. Accept, uh, accept the fact that, that I shed my blood for you. That you can have eternal life. Don't go without trusting me as your Savior. And he's weeping. I believe Jesus is weeping over the world today. You think Jesus is having a party up there and saying, man, I love what's happening in the world today. <laughs> Woo! Boy, yeah. Jesus saying, oh, woe well, unto them. Woe well, unto them. Turn back to me. Turn to me. What did the apostles do? The apostles went to this group and said, look, we can't follow you guys. We're going to follow God. We've been called to follow God. And that's who we have determined we're going to follow. And we will follow him no matter what. So Amelia goes and he talks to these guys about Fiatus. And he talks about, about Judas of Galilee. And says, look, here's a couple of examples. These guys died. Everybody that followed them, they dispersed. They disbanded. And there's no problem to us now. The same thing that <coughs> happened with Jesus. Can you and I say emphatically this morning, that was the wrong answer? How do we know? How long has it been? It's been over 2,000 years. And Jesus Christ is just as strong today as he's ever been, if not stronger. So she too and I determined, I'm not going to be a person of indifference. I'm going to be a person who's going to follow God and what God's word says. You know, to me, that's another thing. You know, we, we go and we follow the things of the world because we don't know what God's Word says. we got to get up and say, wait a minute, this is what the Word of God says. Contrary to what the world says. And I have determined that as for me and my house, this is what Joshua said, 
As for me and my house, I will serve God. That's what I'm going to serve. <coughs> but Camellia, this great wise guy who has all the answers, well, I tell you what, he's not giving them a very good answer. <coughs> Go up to the next verses. Give me 37, uh, 38 and so forth. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men. Don't waste your time. Well, that's a good idea. Because what? These guys are going to win, no matter what. These guys are not going to disperse, no matter what. Don't waste your time from these men. And let them alone, for it is this counsel or this work to be of men, it will come to none. But, that's my favorite word, verse 39. However, let me give you this word of counsel. If it is of God, guess what? It's going to happen. Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. But, if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Have you been trying for 2,000 years to overthrow Jesus Christ? Yes, they have. Have they done it yet? Have they succeeded? Nope. Will they succeed? Nope. Even when they think they're going to succeed, will they succeed? Nope. They can't. You and I, whether you believe it or not at this point, you and I, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, we are on the winning side. We win. Read the last chapter. We win. The Amelia will say, look, if it's a God, you can't overthrow it. Less happily, you be found even to fight against God. And isn't that what the world is doing today? The world is fighting against God. And unfortunately, many in the church, I'm not saying everybody, but many in the church are following after that and not following after God. Is it because the cost is too great? Is it because we are afraid of what's going to happen? What is it going to cost me? Let's look at the response of the apostles. Remember, this is not just Peter and John now. This is all the apostles together. Okay? Watch what happens. Verse 4. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles, they now pulled them out of the other room, brought them into the room, and they had beaten them. That term, beaten, is very, very interesting. If you have anything to do, or have had anything to do with the Greek language, <coughs> you will find that the Greek lang language is much more picturesque than the English language. There's a lot more to <coughs> words than what we just merely see on the page. So when you look at that word, and they were beaten. You know that word beaten means? They were filleted as fish. What does that mean? Oh, they just didn't take a slap on the face. Oh, they just didn't take a couple of little whips on the back, and that was it, the sting them. No, their backs were filleted. Their skin was turned over. When Jesus would beat, he wasn't just slapped around a little bit. He was unrecognizable when they beat him. Why? Because the word means that it was like they were filleted. These apostles now, when they went and they were beaten by this band of super religious people, they filleted their backs in verse 40. And then after they filleted them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Boy, we just filleted their backs. Their backs are wide open. They're oozing and bleeding and they're beaten and they can hardly move. That's the last we're going to hear of them. Really? Wrong answer. These apostles did not get together and say, well, well, it was a good try. I guess we're, we're, going to, we're just, just going to do our own thing and go with the world and, and not hate this anymore. Was that their answer? What did they say? 
Verse 41. They departed from the presence of the council. And they did it. Say, woe is me. I was beaten. I was beat up. I'm bruised. I'm battered. I'm tattered. I give up. Is that what they said? Or they left doing what? What's that word? Rejoicing. What are they, nuts? <laughs> Here they are, their backs are wide open. They can hardly stand or walk. Yet they left rejoicing. Why? Because they saw it as a badge of honor to be beaten for the cause of Christ. You and I would look at it as probably a badge of shame. But they saw it as a badge of honor. And they left that room rejoicing. Hey, Peter, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Why? Because, you know something, I, just, I was just counted for the Lord Jesus Christ. For what he did for me. What he did for me is far beyond what I have just gone through for him. Oh, I feel an honor that I could be beaten for him. I feel an honor that I could take this and, and go through this for my Savior and for my Lord who went through so much for me. This is an honor for me to be doing this. Yet you and I, we get mocked, we get laughed at, we get defamed or whatever the case because of our stand for Christ. We've been told to shut up. We've been you know, called all kinds of names and we go back with our tail between our legs and say, Oh man, I'm not going to do that again. How about if you were to have your back filet? What would you say? That's the last time I'm doing that. What did these guys say? They left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for what reason? For his name. For his name. Hey, these guys are Christians. These guys follow the Savior. These guys are following this Jesus. Let's beat them. Let's fillet their backs. Let's make it so that they never want to do this again. And in fact, what they did is they determined them to go through it even for more. By the way, fast forward. When these men died, they all died of natural causes, right? Do you know that all but one of them were martyred? All but one of them either had their heads chopped off or were beaten so severely that they died and suffered for their wounds. They counted it a honor to go through that. You and I get laughed at, we get mocked, and somebody says to us, oh, you're one of those Christians. You go to community Christian church. What a waste of time that is. What are you, a nut? And they go and we run with our tails between our legs saying, oh, they just beat me. <laughs> Instead of saying, wait a minute, I am honored. If people look at me and say, you're the pastor of community Christian church, yes, I am. And I am honored to be the pastor of Community Christian Church. Amen. I'm honored to be named after the name of Jesus Christ. No matter what you may do. These guys were rejoicing. They were honored. They counted it worthy to suffer the shame for his name. But, if we just stopped at verse 41 for a minute, but don't ask me to go out witnessing anymore. <clears throat> Don't ask me to speak up I give a praise in the temple anymore. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Right? Is that what they did in verse 42? No. What did they do? Daily. How often? Daily. Daily. Every day. They were in the temple. Every day. They went into every house. And they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. How often? Daily. 
Well, Pastor, you want me to go to church on Sunday mornings. That's about all I'm going to do. I'll give you an hour a week or an hour and a half a week. I'll give you an hour and a half a week, but don't ask for any more. Are we going to be a people of indifference? I don't want to be involved. Oh, I'll go buy little trinkets and little things for, for the shoebox and things, but, but that's my ministry for the year. Really? What did these guys do? They got filleted. They had their backs opened up wide. And they went daily into the temple. And they went daily house to house. And they ceased not to preach Jesus Christ. I think you and I as a church need to take a picture of this. I think you and I as a church need to follow this example and not be a church of indifference. Don't ask me to be involved. Because if I get involved, that may, may mean I, it's going to cost me. I may have to give some time, or I may have to do this, or I may have to step out and say, yes, Jesus is my Savior. And I really don't want to do that because, you know, they may laugh at me. Fine. Let them laugh. You know how many times in my lifetime I've been laughed at? <coughs> I've been called a fool. I've been called an idiot. I've been, you name it, I've been called it. I've been called a lot of things that I can't tell you that I've been called. Hmm. You know something? I don't care. I don't care. Look what Jesus Christ did for me. Look what it cost him so that I could have a home in heaven one day to be with him. Look what it cost him so that these guys could go through what they went through and said, you know something? <coughs> I'm going to rejoice in the fact that I can suffer for you. I'm going to rejoice for the fact that I am named with the name of Jesus. Do you want to be named with the name of Jesus? Do you want people to look at you and even point at you and say, hey, you're a Christian. Really? Are you really? Are you, are you willing to stand up for Jesus Christ? So that the world sees you? I did a funeral yesterday. And they had a few songs at the graveside that I did. And the lady, uh, the widow, came up to me and she said, I, I, I put a song in here for you. Because this song represents you. And it represented my husband. And the song is, It Is Well With My <coughs> Soul. She said, Pastor Noise, I watch you and I know that it is well with your soul. And I couldn't help but sing along with the tape that was being played, the song being played, because it is well with my soul. And I don't care. I want to be named with the name of Christ. I want to be named with the name of Jesus. Just like the apostles were here in Acts chapter 5. Oh, Gramelia, oh, he had the greatest answer, didn't he? If it's a man, it's going to fail. <coughs> if it's a God, it's not going to fail. So you can't beat God, so let it go. Well, guess what? He learned that this was a God. Because he could not disperse of them. He could not get rid of them. He could not, even after having them killed, he could not get rid of the name of Jesus. And for 2,000 years, that name is still above every name. That name is still going strong. Let's not be a people, let's not be a Christian community of indifference. As for me and my house, I will serve the as for me and my house. Are you willing to make that proclamation? As for me and my house. Just as they are saying, as for me and my house, I will 
serve the Lord. Father God, help us not to be a people of indifference. Oh, Father God, help us to be a people that, that know what we believe and why we believe it and be willing to stand up and say, yes, I am a Christian. I know Jesus Christ. I will proclaim Christ. I will preach Christ. I will live Christ. Because that's for me and my house. Jesus saved us. Jesus called us. Jesus called, commanded us to go out and to share the gospel. Oh, Father God, help us. Help us to be a church that is going to take a stand for Jesus Christ and not fall to any whim that is just going to be passing through the wind. Oh, Father God, convict us, convince us that we will stand up, stand up for Jesus. Oh, Father God, minister to our hearts needs. We thank you in the name of Christ, God. Amen.